Infection Control Part 2. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA regulates and sets standards for workplace safety. OSHA requires exposure control plans for all potentially infectious material, and these plans need to be updated yearly. Exposure control plans identify job classifications and or specific work-related tasks in which an employee potentially may be exposed to blood and or bodily fluids. The exposure control plan should also describe how an employer will use a combination of safety controls such as needle safety devices and puncture-proof biohazard containers. The exposure control plan also should be reviewed at least annually to incorporate the use of safer medical devices. In our society, medical devices are constantly revised and updated and newer technology is coming out on the market. Therefore, these plans need to be updated with the most safest and effective medical devices on the market for patient safety. <clears throat> the exposure control plan should also be available to all employees for review and training at all times. Post-exposure follow-up. So if someone in the clinic gets exposed to bodily fluids or blood, a bloodborne type infection or potential bloodborne type infection, the first thing that person should do is wash or flush the exposed area. They also will receive a confidential medical evaluation. An incident report will be filed and that patient will be screened and tested for hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, and HIV. Post-exposure follow-up also includes in those people who have been exposed to potentially infectious materials will receive a copy of the physician's written opinion within 15 days of evaluation. They will also receive health counseling about the risks and adverse outcomes. What are some safety controls? So PPE is our number one safety control. Wearing the proper PPE is really important. So examples of this would be wearing gloves, wearing a gown, wearing a face shield when necessary. We also provide training on universal precautions as part of our safety controls. Medical surveillance, hepatitis B immunizations. These immunizations must be offered by every employer within 10 days of starting the specific job duties. Hepatitis B is given in three doses. You get the initial dose and then one month later you will receive your second dose and then six months after the first dose you will get the third. There are also engineering controls such as needle safety devices and puncture proof biohazard containers. Another safety control is that records must be kept for occupational injuries and they must be kept for 30 years beyond employment. OSHA standards for healthcare settings. Universal precautions are used in healthcare settings. This means that all blood and certain bodily fluids must be treated as if known to be infectious or bloodborne pathogens. Precautions must be implemented for all patients regardless of the information available about the per person's individual health history. You may not necessarily know whether a patient has HIV or hepatitis B prior to treating them. Potentially infectious fluids or material. The following are potentially infectious materials require special handling and should have, you should as a healthcare worker have your PPE on prior to handling any specimens of the following. Cerebrospinal fluid, synovial or pleuro, pericardial or peritoneal or amniotic fluids, 
Fluids is sem or semi-liquid blood. Vaginal or seminal secretions. Saliva and dental procedures. Body fluids visibly contaminated with blood. Unknown body fluids. Wound drainage and human tissue, including tissue cultures, cells, and exudates. The CDC's hand hygiene recommendations are as follows. Hands should be washed a minimum of 15 seconds with antimicrobial soap and warm running water. Alcohol hand-based rubs should be used before and after contact with each patient and also after removing gloves. To use alcohol hand-based rubs properly, apply the label recommended amount to the palm of one hand, and label recommended amount is about a quarter size or a little bit less. Rub the hands together covering all surfaces until the hands are dry. Healthcare workers should avoid wearing artificial nails as they have more chance of having pathogenic microbes under the nail. Healthcare workers should also trim nails to be no longer than a quarter inch beyond the skin. Barrier protection, also known as PPE, or personal protective equipment, includes specialized clothing or equipment that prevents the healthcare worker from coming into contact with blood or other other potentially infectious material. This includes, but is not limited to, disposable gloves, face masks, face shields, protective glasses, shoe covers, laboratory coats, barrier gowns, mouthpieces, and resuscitation bags. When should gloves be worn? When touching patients, blood or bodily fluids, mucous membranes or skin that is not intact, handling items and surfaces contaminated with blood and body fluids, performing venipuncture, finger sticks, injections, and other vascular procedures, assisting with any surgical procedure, handling, processing, and disposing of all specimens of blood and body fluids, cleaning and decontaminating spills of blood or other bodily fluids. Environmental protection refers to minimizing the risk of occupational injury by isolating and removing any physical or mechanical health hazards in the medical workplace. Read warning labels on biohazard containers and equipment. Minimize splashing or spraying of potentially infectious material. This is particularly important in the sanitization of instruments. Bandage or break any breaks or lesions on the hands before gloving to provide another barrier. If any body surface is exposed to potentially infectious material, scrub the area with antimicrobial soap and warm running water as soon as possible after exposure. If eyes come into contact with body fluids, continuously flush them with water as soon as possible for a minimum of 15 minutes using eye wash the eye wash unit. Contaminated needles and other sharps should never be recapped, bent, broken, or resheathed. Contaminated test materials should be decontaminated before process, reprocessing or should be placed in improvised bags and disposed of according to the policy. Each clinic policy will have a little bit different way of disposing of biohazard materials. However, each facility is charged for the weight of their biohazardous materials and the amount that they need to dispose. So policies can vary. A lot of clinics, if there's just one drop of blood on a tissue, then that can go in the garbage. But if it is soaking, dripping with blood, that goes in the biohazard container. So there can be variances and differences but for, in general, if it's dripping with blood, it should go in biohazard. If it's just a small, minute amount, it can go in the garbage. Equipment requiring repair that has been contaminated with blood or bodily fluids should be decontaminated before being repaired in the office or transported for repair. 
HIV is not readily transmitted by contaminated surfaces, but HIV hepatitis B can survive for an extended period of time on surfaces. Smoking, eating, drinking, and applying cosmetics, lip balm, and handling contact lenses are prohibited in work areas where a reasonable likelihood of contamination from pathogens exists. Food and beverages cannot be kept in refrigerators, freezers, or cabinets, or on the countertops where infectious material could be present. Work surfaces must be immediately decontaminated with a disinfectant after accidental spill of blood or bodily fluids. At the end of each procedure and at the end of each shift, disinfection and decontamination of all reusable containers must be done on a routine basis. Sharps containers must be close as possible to the work surface area and be filled no fuller than three quarters of the way full or past the fill line. Never pick up spilled material or broken glassware with the hands. There are spill kits available to help assist in safely picking up these materials. Handle soil linens as little as possible and always wear gloves and other protective equipment during disposal. So when we are cleaning the exam room, the first thing that we do is we apply gloves. We take the gown and dispose of it in its area. And then we pull off the paper in which the patient had laid on on the exam table and we throw that into the garbage. From there, we then disinfect the exam table surface. Contaminated materials and infectious waste must be handled with extreme caution to prevent exposure. Aseptic technique. Asepsis is the freedom of infection or infectious material. Oftentimes we are using an antiseptic which inhibits the growth of microorganisms. Medical asepsis is defined as the destruction of disease causing microorganisms causing organisms after they leave the body. Surgical asepsis is the destruction of organisms before they enter the body. Bacteria of the skin, there are transient bacteria, which is surface bacteria introduced by fomites. Resident bacteria found under fingernails, in hair follicles, opening of sebaceous glands, and deeper layers of skin. Most effective barrier against infection is unbroken skin. Hand washing, wash correctly before and after every patient. Using warm water, antimicrobial soap, friction. Friction is the best way to ensure that we are removing as many pathogenic microorganisms as possible. Alcohol-based hand rubs may substitute unless hands are visibly contaminated. Sanitization, cleansing process that reduces the number of microorganisms to a safe level. This is oftentimes considered the washing step, especially for things like surgical instruments. It removes debris such as blood and other bodily fluids from instruments or equipment. It's important to wear utility gloves while performing sanitization. Utility gloves are a little bit heavier in material and oftentimes can prevent, protect the medical assistant against any stabs or cuts that may occur with just regular gloves. Some facilities also use ultrasonic sanitizers. This is a little bit safer method of sanitization because the medical assistant does not need to overly handle the surgical instruments besides putting them in and taking them out. Disinfection. Disinfection is used to clean surfaces and keep them free of infection. This is the process of killing pathogenic organisms or of rendering them inactive. 
Disinfecting agents vary in effectiveness and must be used according to the instructions. Cleansing the surface, such as a countertop or exam table. Examples are Cydex, alcohol, or a 1 to 10 bleach solution. Bleach is also called sodium hypochlorite. Errors in disinfection happen when instruments are not thoroughly sanitized. So there is organic matter, chunks of skin or tissue or blood that inhibits or prevents the action of the disinfectant. Sanitized instruments are not all the way dried. Disinfectant solution is left in an open container so evaporation changes its concentration. Solutions are not changed after the recommended period. Solutions are not prepared properly and not mixed properly. Manufacturers recommended temperature for use and storage is not maintained. Sterilization is the destruction of all microorganisms. It is essential for surgical asepsis. Areas should be set aside in the office for sterilization. Clear, clean plastic bags in which to store sterile packages may be kept in a sterile area. So most clinics have a dirty side of the room or a separate room that will be dirty. It will have all the instruments that came from a patient exam room that have been used that need to be sanitized. And then there will be a clean side where those instruments have just come out of the sterilizer. They, they are rendered not to have any microorganisms on there. So there's oftentimes a dirty and a clean side to um, clinic rooms if there's a lack of space. Patient education, while washing your hands, explain to the patient that this is routine and part of the daily hygiene. Advise patients to carry an alcohol-based hand rub and use it throughout the day. Explain using disposable tissues to cover nose and mouth when coughing and sneezing. Discuss proper ways of discarding used tissues. Instruct patient in the difference between sterile and a clean dressing and bandage.